Sometimes it feels as though I'm in a slow moving car crash when I'm just not sure when it's going to hit the wall. That's what it feels like. And it's not because I am anti-vax because I've been called that. It's because from early 2020, I've been focused on the fact that this spike protein of the virus and anything that you replicate it with is going to stick to a lot of other normal proteins and drive autoimmune responses. This is what I've been saying since 2020. And I, it's difficult because I can see what's going to happen. I just don't know when it's going to happen. And I know what to look for to find what I'm concerned about. And so just by doing a quick search, I can find a very important paper. And this is what happened to me this evening. I just thought, listen, if this is correct, I'm going to find this. And there it is. This is a paper from Taiwan looking at reactive axillary lymphadenopathy after different COVID-19 vaccines. And I'll come to it in just a moment. And this paper is just a reflection of the concern I have with regards to how the immune system is responding and is going to respond down the line to further exposure of spike protein from whatever source. I've called this the COVID storm, where you have two things coming together and literally causing an epoxy or an explosion. Um, that's what I call the COVID storm. So all the indicators are there that this is happening and is going to become more uh, obvious in time, but it's not easy to see. And so it feels as though I'm just talking about random stuff. I have to keep talking about it, but it doesn't make it any easier. So before I go into the paper, I just want to give you a little bit of background with regards to what happens and why I think this is relevant. So the first thing that you have to understand is that, as I show you here, you give the vaccine in the deltoid and because of the draining lymph nodes, it probably should have been this lymph node that was highlighted, the um, spike protein, lipid nanoparticles and the immune cells go to the lymph node, they activate it, they cause it to produce antibodies, trigger T cells, and so therefore the person should be protected against the infection. What then happens is that these lymph nodes can become a little inflamed, but settle down quite quickly. Now, what the Taiwanese were looking at was the fact that there was excessive inflammation in the lymph nodes, not where they were injected. So this is now a very important point, is that it's in the axillary lymph nodes. Now, there may be some drainage to the axillary lymph nodes from the deltoid region, but it's primarily getting drainage from the breast region. So when you look at this image here, the axillary lymph nodes under the armpit here would have most of the drainage coming from breast tissue. And the reason it's relevant is because in the context of breast cancer, if you see axillary node enlargement, it can be an indication that the person has spread into that region. So it's an important point that they have to look out for. So what we had known beforehand, and this was from 2020, was that in this study here, they found that there was significant uptake of um, glucose in lymph nodes close to where someone had been vaccinated. And this was again in cancer screening up to high uptake, which is grade four with lymphadenopathy and increased glucose uptake. So we knew this was occurring since 2021. And I, I think it's been a failure that this has been ignored. It really 
hasn't been properly explored to explore, explain what was going on. But even from 2021, when we looked at this paper here, which was looking at, they called it hypermetabolic lymphadenopathy. And you can see here that up to 25 days after vaccination, 2% of the cohort still had enlarged hyperreactive lymph nodes. Now, you have to realize that theoretically, and this now fits with this other paper, only 78% had normal or no uptake. And so what that means is beyond 25 days, 22% had ongoing lymphadenopathy. Now, this is now where we go back to the paper and we try and get some context with regards to what this means. So when we look at this paper here, it's about reactive uh, axillary lymphadenopathy among different COVID vaccines. This was in Taiwan. And um, what they were looking for is that reactive lymphadenopathy after vaccination is a major concern um, with breast investigations, especially for patients who had a history of breast cancer. And this is because you want to try and find early recurrence. And so if you are having unusual lymph nodes, it can mess up your cancer screening. So this is where it's relevant. And this is why I think they then took some time to look at it. They had compared over a thousand people when they did this study. And what they found here was that axillary reactive lymphadenopathy was 10.9% with regards to AstraZeneca uh, vaccines, 21.3% with regards to the BNT or the Pfizer vaccine, and 21.4% with the Moderna vaccine, compared to 0.6% for those who were not vaccinated. So this is one of those where they, at the time, because it was done in between 21 and 2022, there were not a number of people who were unvaccinated and only 0.6% of them had lymphadenopathy. So we know that this is specific to what is happening with regards to the vaccines. So they have highlighted again in the paper that unilateral, that's one side, axillary lymphadenopathy is one of the most remarkable side effects of severe uh, acute um, respiratory syndrome coronavirus to vaccination. I agree. It is one of the most unusual patterns that we have seen. And they have highlighted that unfortunately, these vaccines have a higher incidence of axillary lymphadenopathy compared to other commonly used vaccines such as influenza, HPV, smallpox, BCG, measles. This is not normal, okay? So that's the first thing that you have to get. Don't let anyone tell you that, you know, okay, this is no big thing. We don't know. They haven't really studied it. They just observe it, and it is very different from what we would expect with other vaccines. As I said here, this was a total of 1,089 patients were included in that study. Um, looking at the duration of lymphadenopathy. And I'll show you what it uh, looked like in just a, a second. But here is an important point, which is relevant. Uh, lymphadenopathy typically lasts for a median of 21 days after vaccination. So normally within two weeks, you expect it to settle. And beyond that, it could actually be calls, considered to be an adverse event um, if it's beyond that period of time or excessive. So this is quite relevant. And when they looked at this, when they compared all of them, this is what it looked like in a graph. This purple line is the closest to one, meaning that uh, the time frame, time at the bottom, and you can see that this is the unvaccinated, non-vaccinated group compared to what happened. This is AstraZeneca, 10.9%. And you have their AstraZeneca, um, Moderna and Pfizer up to over 20% 
of individuals were having significant axillary lymphadenopathy. So this is not an imagination. This is, this is pretty real stuff. Now, it did impact on their ability to screen, um, but they did take some biopsies. I think they only took seven biopsies, which were not um, cancer. So that was good news for uh, those patients at the time. But what I think needed to be clearly investigated is what really is the mechanism? Why is it occurring? Is it just the spike protein? Now, if it was just the spike protein, I would expect that it should be similar between the AstraZeneca, which uses a different um, um, platform, that's the viral vector, but it still produces spike protein. Now that was half in terms of the risk, 10.9, uh, just about half, compared to 21.3 and 0.4% with the mRNA vaccines. So what that means is that it's not just the spike protein, but in terms of the mRNA vaccines, it would be the lipid nanoparticles as well. That could be the likely mechanism why 20% of that cohort could have such significant inflammation for such a long period of time. And when you look at this bit here, this is in the discussion of the paper, um, for the BNT, Pfizer, and Moderna vaccine-related lymphadenopathy, it lasted for a mean of 117 and 137 days, respectively, before resolution. And in some patients, they even had axillary lymphadenopathy for up to 43 weeks after vaccination. Why? What is going on? And when it comes to what I'm focused on with regards to autoimmunity, those are very big red flags because it means that the immune system seems to be driven in a hyperactive way and how it would play out and this is just my theory this is not the science just in case anybody is trying to find a reason to censor this how it would play out in my mind is this if someone already has a risk of autoimmunity so they have say low grade autoimmune disease not yet manifesting with symptoms, you could then cause that immune system to become hyperactivated and drive those autoimmune responses much faster. And how it would present is therefore earlier onset of autoimmune disease. So for, a, for example, you may have someone who was vaccinated and then three, four months down the line, they are found to have, say, systemic lupus, um, erythematosus, SLE. Now, that person may have had that predisposition in place even before, but then what could happen is that they, if they had no interference with their immune system, it may have presented still three or four years later. Does that make sense? So what you then have is an acceleration of the condition. It's very important. So I, my thought is that for many people, it's not that it is causing a new disease, it may in some, but it is accelerating disease pathology that is already there. If 20% can have such significant reactive lymph nodes, up to 43 weeks after being vaccinated, that is not normal and should never be considered so. So when I pull all of it together and I think about the fact that the two things that are happening, because it's, it's one thing if the person has the exposure, they have a hyperactive, a hyperimmune response, and then it settles but you then continue to boost them, therefore not necessarily getting a chance for this immune response to settle. Additionally, they get further exposure through infection of spike protein, which drives even more immune responses. And so what 
I think is happening is that people who have this hyperimmune state, which is subclinical, sometimes they get an infection and that infection suddenly kicks it all off and they end up with unusual disease presentation within a short period of time of infection. That's now how I'm trying to tie the clinical and the research together to explain what I think is already happening, not going to happen. I just don't think it's being adequately recognized because there is not enough research to clarify what really these mechanisms are. There is a huge amount of work that needs to be done. This is, in my view, a nightmare scenario. I was trying to think of an analogy, and the closest I could think is hypertension. Hypertension, not being treated, leaving people with blood pressures over 200 up to 300 for five years, you are guaranteed to end up with heart disease, stroke disease, vascular disease, because of these mechanisms. That's how I'm looking at this situation. We need to understand it. We need to try and find ways to mitigate it so that as many people as can be protected are protected. That's where I am at the moment. As a final point, remember, look out in the description for The Humming Heroes. That um, is an important book in terms of nitric oxide and nitric oxide to protect you against infection. And it's not just COVID, but all these other infections um, floating around. So please look in the description. Remember to like, to comment, to subscribe. This information needs to be seen by as many as possible. And they are doing their utmost that it is suppressed as far as it can. So have a great evening. We look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you. A hero, an immune adventure, humming heroes, your lyrical guide to the body's defenders. Now on Amazon, check the links below.